Today we read in the book of the prophet Jeremiah about Jeremiah's call by God. Today we're going to think about being called by God. Next week we're going to think about what God calls us to do when God calls us. And then the week following, September the 8th, we'll think about what that costs to follow God. So if you can't be here next week because there's some other place you have to be, I don't know where that might be, go to my YouTube channel and click on the sermon for this for next week or the following week. And uh, subscribe if you like. Just click right here. So Jeremiah was one of the four major prophets, along with Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. And then after that come the twelve minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And yes, there will be a test during the coffee hour. Make sure you've got all those names straight. We think of the major prophets, in fact, we think of all of the prophets as pretty impressive people. I mean, who can forget that iconic image of Moses standing before Pharaoh, larger than life, as Charles Heston in the 1950s movie by Cecil B. DeMille. Or, can you imagine what it must have been like when Elijah was on Mount Carmel? You remember that story, I hope, of Elijah, when uh, Elijah stood against the 400 prophets of Baal, and it was a challenge to see whose God was the greater God. And so all the prophets of Baal built altars, and Elijah built an altar, and they each put a sacrifice on the altar. And the prophets of Baal did everything they could think of to bring down the power of their God, and unsuccessfully, even though they cut themselves and did everything they could think of. And Elijah stood there and called on the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And fire came from heaven and burnt up the sacrifice, burnt up the wood, burnt up the twelve great big barrels of water that he had poured over it, burnt up the stones, and burnt up the dust underneath on the ground. I'm not quite sure what that was, but it was dramatic, for sure. So that's the kind of image we might have in our minds when we think of prophets. And what about the call of Isaiah? Chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and the thresholds of the temple shook at the voice of the one who spoke, and the seraphim called one to another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. When we think of those images, we think of immense, powerful, majestic prophets. And they are so remote from who we are. We could never do what they do, because, you know, we're just us. Do you remember the first time when somebody called you Mr. or Ms. or Mrs. and you thought, not me, I'm, just, I'm only 40 years old, what are you talking about? It takes us a long time to grow up and realize that maybe it's time we did something. So yes, these calls to these majestic people make us feel pretty small and insignificant. But hang on a minute. What was Jeremiah's response in that reading today? What did he say? I'm only a kid. Now we don't know how old Jeremiah was when he said that, but just like each of us, it takes us a long time to realize that we're old enough, and as my mother used to say, you're old enough and ugly enough to actually do something, when you actually grow up enough. So we don't know how old Jeremiah was, but in the face of what God was calling him to do, Jeremiah knew he was only a kid. And what about Isaiah? 
in that majestic setting in the temple in heaven? Isaiah says, I fell on my face as one who is dead. And I said, woe is me, I am undone. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And I've seen the Lord of hosts. And the mighty Moses, who did immense and wonderful things, actually started out by running away. <laughs> he ran away because he was afraid for his life from Egypt. And he lived in the wilderness, married. Isn't there a joke about that? The farmer's daughter? I don't, I'm not sure. Anyway, he married a farmer's daughter and lived in the wilderness for a long time until he encountered God in a burning bush. And God told him that God wanted him to go to Egypt to bring the people of Israel out of Egypt. And Moses said no. He didn't actually say no, because saying no to God is awkward. But he said, I can't do it. I don't. I, uh, the, 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 notice I can't speak. Notice God that I can't speak. And then he said, anyway, they won't believe me. The Israelites won't believe me. The Egyptians won't believe me. And God said, well, watch this. And they did miracles and stuff. And, and but I still, I, I stuttered. And Moses, I guess at that point, was really trying to work out the stutter so that God would believe him. And God said, okay, okay. And then Moses said, look, send my brother. Anyway, we came to a compromise and God said, okay, you talk to your brother and your brother will talk to the people. But Moses still went. So all of these people began as quiet, seemingly insignificant people. Look at Ruth, the grandmother of King David. Ruth wasn't even of the house of Israel. She was a Moabitess. She came from a foreign land, and all she had going for her was her devotion to her mother-in-law, which is a strange thing. That's all she had. And God chose her. Look at Mary Magdalene, for heaven's sakes. Mary Magdalene was the first person to see the resurrection of Jesus. The first person to go and proclaim. The first apostle. And where did she begin? She was a woman possessed of seven demons. I don't know what that would be like. I've met people who live in darkness. I've met people who are always hearing voices inside their head and they're afraid to do anything. I've met people whose lives are tormented by what goes on inside of them. And I can only imagine Mary Magdalene was very much like that. But any of those people have realized beforehand that God has something in store for them, even the Blessed Virgin Mary. Was she famous before she became the mother of Jesus? Did, you know, like, did she have wealth and power? Did she come from a great family? No. A simple girl in Galilee that God called. The great apostle Paul, back in the days when he went by his Jewish name, Saul, uh, was a great person, he said to himself. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, well versed in everything, but not in what God wanted him to do. And so when God called Saul, his life was a complete turnaround. So what does that say to us? Do we have to find ourselves as Isaiah was? with a vision of the heavenly temple? Do we have to feel like God is an immense power inside of us before we'll recognize the voice of God? Do we need to be like Elijah on Mount Carmel with fire coming down from heaven? 
Do we need to have demons driven out of us before we can hear the voice of God? Well, you know, after Elijah had that encounter with those 400 prophets and then he ran away after that because the king, whose name was Jacob? No. I can't remember his name. It started with Jacob. That's a good guess, right? Because almost every one of them did. Ken, do you know the name of the king? King. King. Okay. <laughs> His wife's name was Jezebel. I remember his wife. Wow. Anyway. So the king wanted Ahaz. Ahaz. King Ahaz or Ahab? Ahaz. Ahaz? Okay. King. Ahab wants slaves. Pardon? Ahab wants slaves. Well, that's more than I can say right now. <laughs> anyway, he was going to kill Elijah, so Elijah ran away. And he hid. And he was waiting for God to speak to him. And uh, a great earthquake came. And he didn't hear the voice of God in the earthquake. Thunder and lightning came. No voice of God. A tornado came. No voice of God. And while he hid there, deep in the cave, he heard a whisper. And in the whisper was the voice of God. Blaise Pascal, who was a famous French philosopher, and theologian, whatever, said one time that the voice of God is like a sustained whisper that you have to listen to all your life to finally hear. Barry read from Hebrews. You have not come to a holy mountain with trumpets and flames and earthquakes and all of that. The writer to the Hebrews was comparing the experience of the Israelites in the day of Moses when Moses went up on the mountain and received the Ten Commandments. Comparing that to the people in Jesus' day. You have come to the holy city, heavenly Jerusalem, to Zion, to innumerable angels in festival garments. We have come into the presence of the living God. We don't always know it. We're not always aware of it. That's why we need to listen. And in the presence of the Holy God, we may find that God will call us for different reasons, for different purposes. Not all of us will go and uproot kingdoms. Sometimes God will say to us, that person right there that you just met is the one I want you to help. Or God may speak to you at 3 o'clock in the morning as you wake up and think, why can't I get back to sleep? Maybe because you should be listening. And God will let you know what God wants you to do. God will come in the quietness of your heart and ask you to do something that may be difficult. God calls each one of us, individually, quietly, to bring us to where Jesus would have us serve. Sometimes it takes a long time, like the woman who had been crippled for 18 years in our Gospel reading today. Sometimes it's in a flash, like happened with Paul on the road to Damascus. But God does call us. And it doesn't matter what abilities we think we have. I think that probably in the scriptures, the least likely creature to speak for God was the bush for Moses. God used the bush. If God can use the bush, 
I suspect God can use each one of us, is we think of ourselves as a little higher than vegetation on the order of things. So yes, God calls us. And God wants us to serve, to love, and to give ourselves. So don't be intimidated. Don't think because you're not one of the four major or the twelve minor prophets or any of the other great people of the Bible, just because you're not the Blessed Virgin Mary or Mary Magdalene or Ruth or Queen Esther or whomever, just because you're not one of those doesn't mean that God doesn't want you. Because like God said to Jeremiah, before you were a glint in your parents' eyes, I knew you, and I called you. You are mine.